Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for your word and for your Holy Spirit who teaches us and guides us. We're so uh, well aware of our limitations. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish, seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the second epistle uh, to the Corinthians, verse by verse. Uh, we have reached the uh, final chapter, and we're going to uh, be looking at that this Sunday. And I'm hoping to finish the rest of the chapter and maybe give somewhat of a closing, some closing remarks on the, the, uh, these two epistles, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And I hardly know where to start. I do think that it's a little, well, I find it a little, I don't know, sad that we've reached the end of this study. Uh, these studies have been so beneficial for me uh, it's been a great blessing to share them with you. I suppose the best place that I could start uh, would be verse 6, because that's where we left, kind of left off in our last video before, before I interrupted the study to talk about uh, some things regarding what's going on in the Middle East right now. Uh, if you haven't watched those videos, you can go back and look at those. Uh, I just want to say right here from the outset, I just want to thank you all for uh, following uh, me along, uh, studying together with this, uh, 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 with me in in this uh, in these two wonderful epistles because I just think that. that we need to be very, very careful in, in, uh, in our assessment of these two epistles, to look at them in a way that, in the way I believe that God would have us look at these epistles. Now, I've, I have stressed over and over again, uh, several things, one being the importance of context. But I wonder if I have stressed enough the fact that we're not looking at Paul, some hero of the faith. We're not looking at his maturity. We're not looking at his logic, his reasoning, uh, we're not looking at his feelings, his emotions. Now, I'm not saying that they're not there, and I'm not saying that those aren't important. But what I have suggested to you, dear people, is the emphasis here is not on Paul. I want to remind everyone at the outset of this, this last and final video, on this series of studies that Paul was chosen by God to complete the Word of God at a particular time in which Paul, the revelation given by God the Holy Spirit to Paul, was a stand-in, a fill-in, until the Word of God became complete. We've learned in our study that it was given to Paul to complete the Word of God. I can't emphasize that enough. These Christians at Corinth did not have what you have. 
They didn't have the Word of God. And what we have seen as we've traveled through these chapters in both epistles is, is, is that this group of believers at Corinth, which was this group of believers, you might say, were comprised of not just one church in Corinth, but all, all of the believers at Corinth in which the, these letters were probably shared. God is writing to His people, His people. We need to keep in mind that God was talking to His people, not to non-believers. He did mention non-believers to His people in the epistle, but there's no command at all, not only is there any command given to a non-believer to pay attention to what God is saying, but you never once have God, the Holy Spirit, the author of this epistle, reprimand, and I don't know, maybe if that's not quite the right word to use, he certainly exhorted them. He encouraged them. He, uh, and I pointed out how that if, if the Word of God is not, if it doesn't encourage you, it's not the Word of God. I find it amazing that our Heavenly Father and God the Holy Spirit had nothing to say to the Corinthians that was condescending. These, the audience of this epistle is God's children. Not just historically in context, God's children back then, but there's an, obviously an application to us today. God did not condemn the single most carnal gr group of Christians, I think, that ever existed, well, since the before the Great Flood. I can't emphasize enough how carnal and fleshly these Christians were. And what we've come to understand about that carnality and about that, that, that fleshly mindset, the, the, the carnality that God, the Holy Spirit, is pointing out here in these epistles for them and for us is that it has nothing to do with trying to to gain merit or favor with God based upon what we do, our performance. The message was not, you, you guys are just, uh, um, you're the most motley group of Christians, the most horrible, you know, fleshly, carnal, sinful, you know, messed up group of, of, of Christians, and you need to get your act together That's not the message. Now just that right al alone, right there, ought to stop us dead in our tracks and get us to thinking about why this book is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, but it is the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now I could jump to the end of this video and I could just say to you all, It is God's Word and God's Word alone that brings about effectual change in the lives of God's people. Now, let's suppose that I went around with a sign, carrying a sign to everybody I met that said just what I, just what I got through saying. That, that what if I, I, if I had a church and I had a banner behind the pulpit a banner, a big banner up there that said that God's Word alone brings about effectual change in the lives of God's people. They don't bring about that change themselves. I don't think that that would sound too...
do wrong. Now, there is a side of Christianity which would argue, yeah, but Steve, oh, of course God's Word brings about effectual change in our lives. Uh, as long as we do what God's Word says. And I am here to tell you, I don't mind telling you. I, I feel like I would be failing If, if I didn't tell you, and remind you folks that we, neither these Christians at Corinth nor you or I are under law as a rule of life, a principle of life. What is law? It is any given standard whereby we might attain or maintain righteousness on a human level. There is nothing at all in either epistle, 1st or 2nd Corinthians. Not, I mean from the beginning to the end, there is not one shred of evidence that indicates that God the Holy Spirit was appealing to a group of believers, His, His family, the family of, and the household of God, to bring about effectual change in their lives through law. In fact, not, not only is that not true, but it was the very problem that brought about the carnality in the first place. The reason why these believers at Corinth, God called them carnal, well, there were, there were, it manifested itself in numerous ways. But one of the main ways in which it did manifest itself was that They were, they, were, they, were, they were stumbling along sort of in the dark. They didn't have God's revelation to guide them through that period of time. And so there was arguing and infighting among them. And there were divisions. There were those who were saying, I am of Paul, I am of, of, of Apollos, I am of Cephas. We, we come to the end of of the last chapter, the last, the last several chapters of 2 Corinthians, and we see that what the context is, is a, for lack of a better expression, an apologetic by the, God the Holy Spirit defending His Word, the validity of His Word, the, author, the authority of His Word, the effectiveness of His Word, I, I, let, me, let me tell you what it all reminds me of. Of what John wrote in John chapter 7, I believe, chapter 17, verse 17, I believe. Where he, he quotes our own Lord saying in his high priestly prayer to the Father, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify. Now you can translate that word holy. The, the fact of the matter is to sanctify, to, to sanctify something means to set it apart for some particular use. Sue has, in this house, has sanctified Pots and pans, okay? There are certain uh, pots and pans that, that she would she uses for one particular thing and one particular thing only. They are set apart for her use in a particular way. Now you can translate the word sanctified holy, but it means to set apart. To set apart for what? For service. Christ our Lord prayed to the Father that we be sanctified, set apart by truth because God's Word is truth. 
as I read through these final two chapters of 2 Corinthians, what I'm looking at is a, def is a very concise, definitive argument by the Holy Spirit in trying to make it clear without any question that, that Paul is God's representative he, for the Word of God. He stands in, in that time period, that gap, before the Word of God is complete as that authority. And there were those, I'm sure, at Corinth who were questioning that authority. You know, who should we listen to? We left off at verse 5. So picking up at verse 6, But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved. I pray to God that you do no evil. And now, and now right away we can just start making our list of all the, the evil things that come to our mind. God the Holy Spirit uh, through Paul is telling the Corinthians, I pray to God that you do no evil. And what it, what it, so what, what, would that, what would that be? That would be what? No drinking, no smoking, no cussing, no going to movies, no playing golf on Sunday. You know, whatever you want to add to that list. And folks, I can't do that. I've stressed over and over again the importance of context. If we want to know the, about the, if we want to know what the evil is that is being spoken of there at the beginning of verse seven, it's it's just read back a few verses. Since in verse three, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in in me which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. I'm going to suggest that the evil that is being spoken of in verse 7, but I trust that you shall know, or now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved. I, I pray to God that you do no evil. I'm going to suggest that the evil is a continuing uh, a continuation uh, an attitude on the part of the Corinthians where that they would continue to not in in to not see that that Paul was God's was that stand in for God's word until God's word was complete no, the Holy Spirit was not speaking through any other individual but Paul in completing the Word of God. And yet there were many false teachers present. Those who were... that we read about which... in which Satan masquerades his messengers as messengers of the gospel. Listen, folks, you can't tell me. I, I would, I don't know. It, it seems, it seems, it, it would seem awful odd to me that it would not excite you that God writes to the most carnal group of Christians in the New Testament. And, and I want to, I need to stop myself right there and, and at least bring it, to, bring it to mind here that, that that does not mean that there weren't carnal Christians at Ephesus or Philippi or Colossae or, or anywhere else. I think that what we read in this epistle applies to all the other churches. And what we read in those epistles to the other churches applies to the Corinthians. There is an element within Christianity today that says we don't need the Word of God. God is really not the final authority on these matters. Our, our attention, our minds, our focus is not on the, the strictness of, of, uh, and the effectiveness of God's Word, the power of God's Word. It's on 
anything and everything other than that. It's on what we can see, what we can feel, what we can touch, what we can hear. Dreams, visions. Folks, we know we don't walk by sight. We know that God's Word is the only roadmap through, our, through life. The, the difficulty comes in when so many Christians open this book and they read this book, they look at it and they see, well, there's, there's, there's a do, there's a don't, do this, don't do that. Uh, there's a command, we've got to do that. Uh, it's, it's a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. And folks, that just is not true. This book is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. The uh, evil that we need to avoid is this somehow this insidious idea that, I, the, that well, first of all, that, that God's revelation is not complete, that He continues to give that to individuals outside His Word, apart from His Word, and that you know there's some great benefit in experiencing those revelations and those visions and those, those dreams and, and going through these experiences. Just the the mere idea of, of, of our speculating on what we believe to be true. Well, Steve, I don't know how many times I've heard it. Well, Steve, I know that's what the verse says, but I, 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 don't, I don't believe that. And the reason you don't believe that is because you've already developed this uh, preconceived set of ideas where you made up your mind that this is what you believe, and now you go th looking through this book to help find verses to support your view, to support your position. Folks, it's the other way around. We don't decide what it is we believe and then go through this book looking for, you know, what, you know, wh whatever we can find to help support that, that view. Our lives are effectively changed through God's Word. Isn't it amazing that the Lord just said to the storm, you know, peace be still? He just commands it and it, and it, and it happens. I mean, isn't that the, what, what we, look, we, we look at when we go back to Genesis? You know, let there be light. I mean, he just, he just said, let there be light and there was light. He can't, so you're telling me that God can't say, just say, let this man be righteous and, and he's righteous. Let, let this man be forgiven, and he's, and he's forgiven. <clears throat> I don't know why Christians are so adamant, so just die hard insistent on believing that the Christian life is, is little more than, than making ourselves qualified to, to where that we qualify ourselves to fit whatever this book says. I'm trying to get you to reverse your thinking here. As we close out this second epistle, and in the last chapter, we're looking at, what we're looking at is these believers at Corinth sanctified by truth. Sanctified in truth because God's Word is true. God's Word brings about, uh, brings about the effectual change in our lives today just as it did in the lives of the Corinthians back there it, during that time. His Word does that. I, I can't... I just want to scream it from the rooftop. I, 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 want, I do not want you folks to miss the most important factor in all of this. And that is, it is God's Word that brings about the change that you so desire in your life. It's the very truth itself sanctifies you. It sets you apart for service, for God's service. There is nothing that you could do outside this book. Just I'm, We just close it. Let's put it away. Now we don't have it. Just like the Corinthians back then, they didn't have the Word of God. So they had to have someone to listen to. Well, Paul, are you, the, uh, are, are you that authority? Should we be listening to you? Should, should we be listening to this guy? Should we be listening to this guy? Should we be 
looking around us externally, you know, looking at, the, at the, our lives and our circumstances and what appears to be on the surface in some indicators that, that, that whatever indicators we can find that would justify our believing what we believe. I don't think for a second, folks, that there was very much on more, much else on 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 God, the Holy Spirit's mind. I'm not. Let's don't. Let's. This is not about Paul. That there was not that much on the Holy Spirit's mind in closing this these epistles, except to remind these Corinthians that not only is is God's word the only authority, but that it, it is effective beyond measure. It has the ability to do what we can't do ourselves. Truth, folks, listen dearly beloved. Truth is what changes your life. If I tell you a lie, it's not, it's not going to bring about any positive, effectual change in your life. At all. But if I tell you the truth, there's every possibility that that truth alone, without you doing anything, if I were to tie your hands, would bring about dramatic, effectual change in your life. Why do you find that so hard to believe, even on a human level, that truth can bring about positive change in the lives of the most carnal group of Christians God ever thought to record in the New Testament? And, and it is, to me, it is utterly astounding that he says this to a, a, the most carnal group of Christians, I think, that ever there ever was. I'm not saying that that same carnality doesn't exist today. It certainly does. But why? Why does that fleshly carnality exist among Christians today? because they're not hearing the truth of the Word of God which will bring about the effectual change in their lives which they so desperately desire. Not that we should appear approved, Paul says. It has nothing to do with... I, I'm not trying to, to, to do what I'm doing with you folks so that I appear approved. but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. We can't do anything against the truth, which is basically what the next verse says. We can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak. Wow. I thought we were... To supposed to be glad when we're strong not glorying in our weakness it, it it just continues to astound me how that that the way things are today in this generation in which we're living which i believe is just prior to our lord's return is Christians tend to take the opposite view on everything. Satan has so flipped everything around 180 degrees. The word can the word can clearly state that when I'm weak, then I'm strong, and yet Satan insists that well, it's just the opposite. How can there be any strength and weakness? You got to be strong. We are glad, we are happy, we're blessed when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. Now we know from Colossians, we know we're complete in Him. This word is not that same word. It's, it, in fact, that word perfection is only used once in the New Testament. I, I don't have any problem with the, with the translation. I'm, I'm going through the authorized version. I'm looking at, at perfection. I don't see any problem with that. 
It's not, we know that he's not talking about some perfection that, that, is, that comes about as a result of our best foot forward. You know, or that, you know, or that the Corinthians needed to turn over a new leaf. I suppose you could say they needed to turn over a new leaf, but, but the, I, I would suggest that the new, new leaf they needed to turn over was the pages of Paul's letter. <coughs> we don't, it's our lives, we don't boast in ourselves. Our lives are not some life that we can say, well, I turned over a new leaf. You know, so, you know, you should too. Dearly beloved, that's law. That's not grace. Paul is wishing that they would come to realize the true nature of their position in Christ in which they, their lives are only perfected through the truth of this book. The Holy Spirit has not abandoned the whole idea of the whole narrative of the of the argument or the what you'd call maybe perhaps the uh, apologetic of defending His Word, the authority of it, and the effectiveness of it. And this through the Apostle Paul, no one else. Paul was specifically chosen for that task, and the Word of God is complete. And now you and I, we have this Word of God. We've had it for nearly 2,000 years. There is nothing outside this book that is going to, to, to draw you one microcosm of a step closer to God. No, no, no experience, no dream, no vision, Nothing else, not, nothing that some other preachers that I say or any other preacher says. I can sit here for 30 minutes and I can, I can just spout one error after another. All right. Where that there's absolutely zero benefit in that other than, other than perhaps you learn by watching it, that it's error. So I, you know, so there's some benefit that even to be gained from error. I, I remember back in Bible college, we used to sit around and argue about, well, does God uh, use error in the lives of God's people? Well, of course He does. Therefore, I write these things, verse 10, being absent, Lest, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me. What, what power did the Lord give in this book? His Word. Uh, Paul didn't have a magic wand. He didn't have some power. He didn't have a, some, you know, I don't know, supernatural sword to slay his enemies. which the Lord has given me to edification, not to destruction. This is the Holy Spirit. This is God the Holy Spirit talking to you, saying that He does, he does not do anything in your life to tear you down, only to build you up. And it all comes through this book. Lest being present, I should use sharpness. It was not Paul's desire that he come and, ha and have to be to point out their stupidity. But even if he had, even if he did, it would not have been to their destruction. It would not have been to tear them down, but only to build them up. Paul, the, God the Holy Spirit, in your life and mine, never, ever says anything to you to tear you down. You know, we, we, we know from the, the book of John how, how the Holy Spirit was sent and given us as a comforter 
Well, you know, what does, he, what does the Holy Spirit do? He's all, okay, so He's our comforter. So as, he, as we're going along and God the Holy Spirit is our comforter, He's going to tear us down. Finally, brother, in verse 11, farewell. Be mature. Perfect. The word is mature. The path to maturity, folks, is this book, not what we think is true about this book, or, or not what we think this book says, or not what we think someone else says, or not what we see with our own eyes or feel with our own the nerve endings of, of the flesh. Be of good comfort. The most motley group of Christians to ever live, and he's telling them to be comforted. Be of one mind. Be of one mind. How do, how, how do we, as Christians, how do you think, folks, that we could possibly, with all the viewpoints, all the different uh, doctrines, all, you know, ideas, viewpoints, all the different philosophies, all the different uh, interpretations, all the different denominations, all of the different flavors of Christianity, all the, di the difference in all the ethnicity involved in Christianity, all of the circumstances in which they're, the circumstances are never the same, they're always different, how do we, how, how can we possibly all be of one happy mind? I mean, of one, one mind. How can we do that? How can we do that? Well, folks, the, the, the answer is obvious. In Christ, in the Word of God, and in Christ, the... There's nothing but unity. It's when we move outside that realm of, of the Bible being the, the authority, the final authority, that, it, that, that the Bible is, is just what it is. It's God's Word. There's nothing to be added. There's nothing to be taken away. That Christ is our focus, not ourselves. That He's our righteousness, that we have none, no righteousness in and of ourselves. There's none righteous, no, not one. Just the, the, the truth of the Word of God, which brings about that effectual change in our lives, brings about that oneness of unity, that oneness of mind. Live in peace, the text says. Verse 11, live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Dearly beloved, what is it you want? Really, I mean seriously, what is it you want? Do you, uh, you want to wake up every morning and, and go, go about your day in, a, in, a, in some agonizing ways to try to appease some angry God that you feel like that you have to appease in order to gain merit or favor with that God? That, that if you don't do that, that He's mad at you, that He doesn't love you, that you're not going to heaven, You've got to qualify somehow. How could God even say that, that His give us, quite clearly in this 11th verse, give us His love and His peace, and we live like that. I don't know how many... I would say, I would venture, I, I'll, I'll go as far as to say there's, there could very well be millions of Christians living today who have God's love and God's peace and God's forgiveness. And I don't think this is any stretch of my imagination to say this, that they don't believe it. They don't believe it. You can be forgiven and not believe it. God can love you and you not believe it. You can have God's peace and and not, not, not believe it, not realize it, not know it. Why? Because you're not believing God in what He said. You're looking for that, somehow looking for that outside of everything. You're not going to find it. Greet one another with a holy, I'm going to say handshake. 
All the saints salute you. All the saints. Well, what is that's verse uh, 13. Who are, who are all the saints that he's referring to? All the saints at Jerusalem. All the saints ever that there ever was. Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't really. Uh, I mean, if you looked at it strictly in the context, you know, all the saints. I you know, suppose that's all the saints living at, during that time. I mean, you know, you could say that. I think the point of the message, I think the, the intent of the statement by God, the Holy Spirit, is to make, to put the truth in the, in the hearts and the minds of the believers there at Corinth that they are no different or better or worse than any other Christian. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the, and the, fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, Paul's saying, uh, I hope that that's the case. That, that, I hope that's, that's true. Boy, if, if, if man, I'm going to close this letter with, with wishing, wishing that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, wishing that the love of God, wishing that the communion of the Holy Spirit be with these Corinthians. And I think that's well, foolish to look at it that way. This is not a wish or a desire on the, on the part of the Apostle Paul that these believers at, at Corinth would somehow uh, receive the love of God or, or the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus. It's, it's the word, folks. Take take note of the fact that the word "may" is not even there. You know, it'd be different to say, "Well, may the grace, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all." Maybe it will be. Maybe it won't. That's not what we're reading. We're reading that it is. And uh, Amen. Let it be so. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there with that. With uh, and leave you folks, you dear precious folks, with the idea of, to think about. I hope that you spend some time thinking about it. That God's Word is what brings about effectual change in our lives. It's only done through the truth of the Word of God, nothing else. I love you all, I truly do. Keep looking up. Let not your heart be troubled. Rest in Him. Until next time. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.